Hello, world, and welcome to another podcast of It's Not You, It's Autoimmune with your host, Dr. Jocelyn Eberstein. Dr. Jocelyn Eberstein has over 25 years of experience as a doctor of oriental medicine, medical acupuncture, and functional medicine practitioner. As a community, we are stronger and wiser. You got this, America, where good health is just a podcast away. Welcome to a new episode of It's Not You, It's Autoimmune. And today we're going to continue out our two-part series on cancer. I'm your host, Dr. Jocelyn Eberstein, and in this episode, we're going to be talking about treatment options, what to do during active treatment, and how to reduce your risk of recurrence. So the goal of traditional oncology is get rid of the tumor. Let's destroy, let's eradicate it. There's really not much patient participation. And it's really important because cancer is not, they don't play nice, okay? There's nothing nice about cancer. So we really have to get rid of it. And it's entirely independent of the patient. Well, the goals of functional medicine or integrative medicine is that even though we still want to go and eradicate the tumor, just like the on traditional oncologist, what we do is a little bit different during that time versus after. So the issue is, is that your immune system gets just hit so hard, so hard during a treatment. And what we do is support the body, support the immune system, support it with lifestyle, with supplements, with herbs. These things will not only speed healing, speed recovery, and the recovery between treatments, which is so important and critical for traditional oncologists too, because a lot of times treatments get stopped because the patient can't take it anymore. Their white blood cells are, you know, flatlined. They just can't, they just can't sustain the treatment. So treatments are stopped short of their goals. So we also look at, and traditional oncology does not, relieving the symptoms in general from cancer and relieving the symptoms from chemo and radiation. And then after the treatment, we want to reduce the risk, which is most important after the treatment is over. So nutritional status is critical, critical for cancer care, because when you came in and got the cancer diagnosis, your nutritional status was not so great because that's how the cancer grew and we discussed that on our last episode. So with um, when you're going through active treatment, what we're trying to do is get you to actually improve the, the, the body that you came in with, right? So it's m critically important to maintain and improve this status, to get adequate um, calories, adequate proteins, adequate fats, and most important, not micronutrients, because the micronutrients assist the treatment. And what we find is if patients follow these plans, they do better with both the chemo and the radiation. And what we find is that there are the treatments are m less um, more effective, rather, and you get less side effects. So you manage both the side effects from chemo and radiation, and then the big insults that radiation gives you to the tissue, right? So you're minimizing toxicity and improving tolerance to treatment. My issue being in the cancer world was I would go to these infusion areas where you had, where you were given uh, IV uh, chemotherapy, and do you know what they give? Yeah. Do you know what they give the patients? cookies and juice and candy, right, during the treatment. Now, if you were listening last, last episode, uh, we know that cookies and candy and sugar are drivers of making a tumor get bigger. So now you're trying to kill the tumor and grow it at the same time. And I, I actually, if you go on their website, on the American Society website, they ask you to have things like, uh, puddings and custards and milkshakes and desserts and white toast and pretzels and noodles, all, all drivers of cancer, both the insulin, which makes it grow, and the sugar, which causes inflammation. So uh, it's not a good idea. <laughs> Synergetic, uh, synergistic botanicals, they improve both radiation and chemo, and they destroy the can cancer cells. So synergistic botanicals are herbs. Everybody knows about herbs, and they're things that are often very household items. And what they do is they 
are synergizers, so they augment the treatment. They make it better. They make the radiation and chemo actually enter the cancer cells. So the sooner you do this, the better you're going to do, and you're actually going to prevent this thing called um, chemo chemo resistance. All right. So things like so cancer cells are really smart. So they learn how to reject the chemo, and they get this chemo resistance effect, and what we do is outsmart that, all right? We outsmart the cancer, and we create a body that's just so resilient to the growth of the tumors while they're getting attacked. So diet, as we explained before, is super important both during treatment and after treatment. That, it is critical, and it makes the chemo work better than chemo alone, all right? Helping the body get through the treatment helping the, body, the, the toxicity effects of the chemo better and basically drives the treatment into the vulnerable cancer cells. So let me explain how cancer cells are. They're kind of very wimpy cells. They, um, they're not very healthy. So they get too hungry, they get too cold, they get you know, too depleted of nutrients. They're totally vulnerable. So what we like to do, and a lot of oncologists are, have always known this, is we like to put the body in what we call a keto state, keto, state of ketosis. So that's a fasting state. Now, Oncologists are really scared of putting already skinny pan cancer patients into a ketosis because they're afraid they're going to lose more weight. But the weight that, that these cancer patients have lost is, um, is called cachexia. And cachexia is basically muscle wasting. It's not weight that needs to go off. So what we do is we put the body into ketosis pre-cancer treatments, all right? So pre-cancer treatments. And what this ketosis state does is it's like a Trojan horse. It's going to carry this death missile into the cancer cells, all right? Because they're, they're vulnerable. It makes them vulnerable. So we kind of starve the patient. And so there's a lot of ways to get into ketosis. You can do a low calorie. You can fast, 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 regular fast. Um, there is another um, way to do it, which is uh, called fast mimicking. It was developed by Dr. Longo and, by the way, commissioned by the American Cancer Society because they wanted a way to be able to have cancer patients before they actually went into treatment be able to eat a little so the oncologist didn't get so scared. So they put $40 million behind this um, this plan. Hopefully we'll have him on the show one day. But um, what it does is allows the patients to eat. The body thinks it's fasting. The brain thinks it's eating. So when you do that before a cancer treatment or be in ketosis, like just a keto diet, which we have discussed on previous episodes, um, that will also allow you to get the cancer's super vulnerable, starve them out. And then when we bring in this... Um, the stealth bombs, all right, <laughs> with oxidative chemotherapy or radiation, we improve the effect, okay? You're carrying the bombs right into the cell. The rest of the tissue is quiet, and just the cells get killed. So um, the, the net effect is that patients, you, you would think it's, oh, they might lose a couple pounds. That's not it. They bounce back a lot more quickly. The weight comes right back on. They have a positive energy, positive, and they're, they, they don't lose their energy. Um, and what we also know that the recommendation of, oh, eat anything you want because you're so skinny is really bad because sugar and insulin make you make the cancer cells desensitize. So it, they don't care about the chemo as much because they're growing, they're happy. So, so when treating with botanicals or herbs, you ha number one, you have to go to a really, really, really um, skilled practitioners. You don't do this on your own. You don't go to Dr. Google. You do, you have to have somebody who knows what they're doing. And um, the first, so we have different stages during uh, the development of cancer. So each stage has a little bit of a different um, therapy. So the first stage of cancer is called initiation. And in initiation, basically, it's just the DNA has gone rogue. It's just going wrong. Or the DNA expression is wrong. So we talked last time about 
that the DNA you got, that's all, that could be like less than 5% of the whole cancer story. It's pretty much how the DNA expresses itself, and it expresses itself or manifests according to the environment outside your body and inside your body. So whatever you did to your body, and this is this genetic expression is called epigenetics. So the, at this stage called initiation, I want you to understand at that point, it's the cells haven't uh, the cells are abnormal, but the tissue's not any different. So there's things that you can do. This is the good news: things you can do, and because it's initiation, these are things that everybody should do if they're interested in cancer prevention. So things like turmeric, you know that really bright yellow spice, <laughs> a lot of turmeric. I take it in pills. Garlic. Anybody who does not cook with garlic, it's like that's a no-brainer, right? Um, green tea. Green tea is easy. How do we take green tea? Well, I don't like the way it tastes. It's bitter, blah, blah, blah. What we do with green tea is you take like four bags, flavor it up with something, or put it in your smoothie, or put it in your drink. It comes in powders. Easy to do, right? Um, skull cap, that you'll need to get in an herb. And resveratrol, which everybody hears about, resveratrol drink wine. Well, you have to be a frank alcoholic to get enough resveratrol in you to really prevent cancer. So what we want to do is take it in supplement form. Okay, so that's good at preventing that first stage of cancer and the DNA damage, so before it actually manifests. The second stage of cancer development is called promotion. Now, at this time, you've got these abnormal cells that start to divide and they start to get together and have a little party. And this is the beginning stage. So the doctor will say something like, oh, you have a polyp, <laughs> right? Oh, it's a precancerous collection. Let's just watch. Watch for what? <laughs> for it to get worse? Do something. So, so the cells grow. There's nothing funny about it, but it is funny. Like when they tell you watch and wait, it is not a good thing. So, um, so the cells grow. They get more uh, abnormal. They get aggressive. They have the potential to grow. Then they start to invade tissues, and they spread to other parts of the body. And this, at this second stage is when it's true cancer, all right? But here's the good news. Your body can tell the cell, it can t the, kill, the kill switch, it's got a kill switch called apoptosis. It tells the can that cell to die. You need to die. And remember, we talked about that cells only are supposed to replicate maybe 42, 46 times, and then they're supposed to die anyway. But, and, your immune system recognizes cancer cells. They're supposed to eat these things up, gobble them up. They're called macrophages. They like big eaters is what that means. So these big eaters come out and, and eat them up because they're, they're abnormal, right? So apoptosis is a good thing. Having a really competent immune system is a good thing. These macrophages are also good for COVID. So good idea to get your macrophages up. <laughs> so the real danger about uh, the real danger and cancer is not the cancer. It's not the original cancer tumor. What it is is the lack of control, the lack of the kill switch being turned on when appropriate, all right? And all of this control is under, um, all of the, uh, the kill switch control is under the control of our mitochondria. And mitochondria, hopefully everybody went to sixth grade biology, is the powerhouse of the cells. So let's talk about some herbs for apoptosis, all right? Apoptosis, again, let's listen. Listen again. Turmeric, garlic, green tea, memorize that. Okay, those three. Uh, Skullcap, also licorice. That's easy. They have licorice tea. Don't get... get um, if you have hypertension, don't take that. Uh, reishi mushrooms, so that's usually in a pill form, but just mushrooms of any kind are very helpful. We really like shiitake, that is definitely good. And milk thistle, because milk thistle helps you get rid of these cancer cells in your liver, it's super good, super important. So in this, um, in this stage, uh, what we wanna do is um, stop the cancer promotion stage. So in that stage, what we're going to use is um, green tea, again, resveratrol, remember that one, <laughs> uh, uh, milk thistle, soy, and reishi mushrooms. So again, you, you're listening to some of these over and over. They're things you can incorporate in everyday life. And 
The last thing I want to talk about is progression. That's the last and final stage of cancer development. Okay, this is the tumors set in, they take hold, they get aggressive, they're ugly. All right, again, what do we use? <laughs> Repeat after me green tea, <laughs> uh, reishi, soy, and flax, especially if you have reproductive tumors, uh, breast, prostate endometrial cancers, and uh, flaxseed. So that's, again, things you can incorporate just because. These things are very regulating for your, uh, for your hormones, for your immune system. The green tea deep, deep dive is I want to spank anybody who does not take green tea, <laughs> all right? Because green tea takes cancer-causing chemicals and does this thing called conjugation. This happens in the liver. And so in the liver, there's like five different pathways to really get rid and eliminate, eliminate toxins of any kind. It could be pesticides. It could be your own body's you know, stress toxins. It could be anything, hormones. So what it does is it kind of makes it into a form that your body can get rid of it either through the kidneys, uh, so through the urine, or through the um, or through your bowel movements, all right. So that's the way that it eliminates. So you're binding them up, packaging them up, and we talked about the garbage trucks taking them out. So that's what green tea does. It'll also stop DNA damage. Who doesn't want that? There's so much potential for DNA damage in the, in the environment, and and your bad thinking or your stressful thinking. That damages DNA. And then it stops the damaged DNA from going to the promotion stage. So remember we said initiation, then promotion, where it starts to turn into real cancer? So it stops that. And say you already have a tumor, all right? So what it'll do is keep that tumor from getting bigger. <laughs> Good idea. And it'll prevent an established cancer. So you've got a cancer in your body. And after it starts to grow and grow and grow and has nowhere else to go, it starts moving it through the body and spreading through the body. So green tea will prevent that cancer from spreading through the body and progressing. So these are all things good, <laughs> think, with green tea. So when you enter this house of cancer, when you've opened that door, it starts with screening and diagnosis. Okay, so that's, that process is stressful, right? The screening, if you've always got this cancer, cancer mantra in your head because your mom had it or your dad had it or your sister or your friend, you can't go there because it's less than 5% of that is yours if, you're, if you've got the family history of cancer. So the second part after, so say you've got the diagnosis, you went through the screening, screening room, <laughs> You're, the, then you got the diagnosis, so now you're going to go to the room that says treatment, and, and then after treatment comes treatment recovery, okay, active treatment recovery. That's you've had all the chemo, all the radiation, oh, it's done, and now you're recovering because it takes a lot to recover from these treatments. So, and then the last room that you're going to be in, and that's the place you're going to live for a really long time, is called recovery survivorship. The fear that most patients have is of recurrence. Almost every cancer diagnosis has the fear of recurrence. And rightfully so. I mean, cancer, uh, you know, cancer, 70% of you get, get it again. They used to say that if you, if, you got, if, you got, if you got through the first five years, good, you're done, go at it, right? And a lot of cancer patients do go at it, which is not great. They don't really pay attention. Um, the five-year I'm cancer-free news is old news. The new news is cancers tend to recur at 10 to 15 years. And here's the problem with that, is that at 10 to 15 years, you're not going to be seeing your oncologist you know, every three months, all right? And first, because there's not enough of them, but then there's no reason, right? So really what, what happens, and, and this is super important, what has to happen if you, is you have to have ongoing treatment, ongoing care, meaning you need to see your primary, you need to see your functional medicine doctor, you need to see your acupuncturist, you need to see people that are always going to keep you on track because they're going to have radar to see, oh, maybe there's a problem here. Like there's a study that came out of the VA and with one visit, okay, one visit to another practitioner, uh, decrease their risk of mortality of dying 
36 to 57 percent. Okay, what if that was a drug? Like, how much would that cost? <laughs> um, that's that's the problem. That's you have to have other eyes looking at you all the time. Most patients fear the treatment of cancer way more than the disease, and the reason is well, let's think about it. Number one, it's brutal, right? Everybody's seen cancer patients, right? But if you had, say, a heart attack, oh, I had a heart attack, or I'm having a blocked artery, well, what happens? You go to the hospital, you go to sleep with anesthesia, and then you wake up, and boom, you have a stent, you're all better, you're done, right? You're in and you're out. But even with that serious of a, um, of a diagnosis and procedure, less than one, one, to, one out of every 10 follow the diet, like, honestly, that's not competent, it's not a good idea. So, so let's talk about some of the most important factors that have to deal with this cancer recurrent, okay, recurrence. And the cancer recurrence issue is that people think, oh, I'm just gonna do a diet, you know, pop a few pills. But the hardest thing to do, and the, I think between one and two, it's the most important thing, is really looking at stress stress management. Most people don't do enough of that. And what has to happen is you have to change your relationship to stress. And that requires some internal work. It requires us to ask a lot more questions and really to examine ourselves and really how we relate to the world. Like, why do we want to live? I mean, these are really important questions to have you have a reason to be there and a reason to continue to manage your stress. I mean, I would like for you to be, you know, I would like for you to have stress and not become the stress. And a lot of my patients will say, yeah, you know, um, I had this really stressful event and then I got cancer, got the cancer diagnosis. What they didn't really look at is the 10 years before, what was going on because our lives today are pure stress. There's like, you know, it's the car, it's, it's the traffic, it's the finances, it's COVID, it's the relationship. It's just relentless. And what stress does, it suppresses our immune system. Basically just unravels us, un creates disease, inflammation. And with regards directly to cancer is that it drives the tumor development and the metastasis, right? So the, the spreading of the cancer. And it's a causative agent, right? So we can get also stress just from our environment. I mean, we're looking at the, uh, we have never had such an assault on our bodies as we do today with the, with the toxins in the, in the environment, in the air, in the water, in the food. It's horrible. So chronic stress, I don't care how much you do, I don't care that you do everything perfect for cancer prevention. If you don't get the stress piece, it's not gonna stick. It won't sustain, and that's why it's super important to keep to happen to to keep up your stress management. And there's various ways to do it. Uh, we'll probably put some of those on the downloads because we don't have enough time today. But well, that used to be my number one thing. If I had one tool in my toolkit, and that's for almost every disease, is movement. Right, movement for cancer, and. If we actually look at risk reduction, which is that's what we're talking about, with reproductive cancer, so we're talking like prostate, um, breast cancer, colon cancer, you've got a 50% decrease in recurrence. I'm gonna repeat that. 50% decrease in recurrence. And, well, a patient often say to me, well, <laughs> like they're flatlined from the treatment, like I can't move my body, what am I gonna do? I said, you do what you can. You gotta figure out where your fitness level is at the time. So the, the, um, the research always says five days a week, 30 minutes a day, all right? Well, we want you to work at your edge, whatever that edge is, and you keep that edge moving. So if you're flatlined, I tell my patients, lie in bed and pretend you're walking. You know, And even if it's for three minutes, just do it because that alone will improve your immune system, right? Improve your immune competence. Now, let's go back to patients who are, who are fit. And, you know, five days a week, 30 minute brisk walk, no brainer, right? Those people still have to move that edge. 
the more fit you are, the more you need to do, all right? So don't, don't be slack on that just because the recommendations are five days a week, 30 minutes a day. Well, diet is as good as any drug. And it's the easiest thing to do when you're dealing with post-cancer treatment, trying to prevent a recurrence, because you think about food all day long, like two to three times a day, right? And what's important about the diet is, okay, so think of a pill, like a pill. You'll take like 100 milligrams, 1,000 milligrams, whatever, milligrams, right? When you're eating food, all right, it's grams. It's like ounces or 28 grams. So you just think about that information that you're actually giving to the cells, that's what's important about your diet. You need to give your body the right information so it can make better decisions about how to beat the cancer. So the best diets, say you're following them perfectly, are about a 30% risk reductions. So that's in most cancers, all right? So a cancer patient has to really be, pay attention to, they cannot do the sugar diet. They can't, they, they can indulge sometimes, but don't make it a rule. Don't say, oh, just because I have cancer, I'm just gonna, I don't have enough, you know, I, I'm just gonna have my fun. It's really not healthy. Well, that trifecta is magic. The trifecta is where all these powerful strategies combine optimizing your health, mobilize cell control, manage blood sugar inflammation. It is the trifecta. So we're talking about stress management, we're talking about your, your, your diet, and we're talking about movement, all right? So those are, that's gonna be really the best way to manage and, and, and really prevent a recurrence because if these, inflammation, uh, blood sugar, uh, cell control loss. If that's out of control, you're gonna increase your risk for a recurrence. So let's talk a little bit about the, some of the best returns on investment. We're between, we're gonna do those three things, but here's how you live really to prevent the cancer. What you're gonna do is really live in accordance with nature. We're talking about, again, clean air. What kind of clean air? Well, you can go out in nature. If you live in a polluted environment, indoor air is the most polluted. So you get an air filter, you, especially in the rooms that you stay a long time. I'll make some recommendations online. You need to eat clean food. And not only like, oh, I eat, uh, oh, I don't eat sugar, but I eat, uh, I eat pesticide fruit. That's not gonna work. You really have to be more mindful, right? So you have to be aware of what you're putting in your body. You need clean water. Okay, well, it's expensive. I can't afford air. I can't afford a water filter. Start with like a Brita. I mean, it's nothing. You can do little things. You have to have more of an awareness of your surroundings and know that you're not being poisoned by the air, food, and water. And at this time in your, in your life, I mean, I recommend organic as much as possible. Uh, Walmart has organic food, okay? We don't have to not do organic food because it's not available or it's too expensive. Just the most important, by the way, organic food you're gonna have is gonna be really your, your proteins, your fish, your fish and your meat, all right? That, that stuff needs to be um, grass-fed, it needs to be organic because that's where the most toxicity is gonna be. And as far as your water filter, like I said, go get a Brita. It's nothing, right? At least start there, all right? There is an organization called the Environmental Working Group and that organization, please donate to them if you can because they're really a good group. And what they do is they post all the toxins, both environmental, even your, what your water supply is in your area, what toxins are in there. And they uh, put out this list of the clean 15 and the dirty dozen. Stay away from the dirty dozen when you're buying your fruits and vegetables, okay? Mostly, as I said before, mostly vegetables because the fruits drive sugar. So start with that, Start. it should be easy. The, uh, the next thing that I really want you to pay attention to is really, again, I I'm talking about your environment. Really get in the cycle of the day, cycle of light, all right? I want you to get outside 
um, at first sunlight, have that sunlight hit your pine pineal gland and your pituitary. Why? Because that restores rhythm to your body. When you got cancer, your, your body went out of rhythm. Those cells didn't know when to stop replicating. So we're gonna restore your rhythm and put your body back on track. Back on track, yeah, let's talk about back on track with sleep, all right? So no screen time. We have to stop the screens. I'm talking the, the iPads, the phones, the TVs, and the computers, all right? You have to do it probably within two hours of sundown. So in the summer, maybe 11 o'clock, no screen time, done, over, close it down, shut it down, listen to music, write poetry, read poetry, unplug your Wi-Fi's. Why? Why is Wi-Fi? Because this 5G causes DMA, DNA damage, right? We need our DNA. So what happens when our DNA gets damaged, and you have to visualize this, it's First off, the DNA is inside. It's wrapped around with these chromosomes, and you've seen pictures of it, right? And then at the end of the chromosomes are these things called telomeres. They're like little shoelaces at the end of the at the end of the chromosomes, and these get very shortened. They get shortened as we get older and as we do damage. And when these shoelaces come off, the chromosome chromosomes kind of unravel it's kind of like they open their kimonos and inside lives dna emfs allow that kimono to come open and get into your dna all right so no emfs especially in the bedroom we like the bedroom a little chilly so you restore the rhythm and function of the cells especially the mitochondria these are our vital powerhouses. They're, 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 they're the powerhouses of the cell. In Chinese medicine, we call it qi. In Indian medicine, we call it prana. It is your life force, all right? So with all these recommendations, I think I want you to really remember that don't let perfection get in the way. Um, don't be perfect. Just don't let perfection be the enemy of good. We want to start start with eating the clean 15. Then maybe you'll progress to organic and you'll start with your Brita filter. It's easy. You just got to do it in bite-sized pieces. So these recommendations not only will make keep you from getting the cancer and prevent its recurrence, but during a um, during your treatment, during cancer treatment, it'll make that cancer treatment hum. It'll be really honestly super helpful during the active phase of treatment. So as I said, cancer is a huge, big topic. It's called the big C for a reason. And while we've touched on things like what is cancer, who gets it, how do we prevent it, and um, how to keep, uh, prevent its recurrence, um, we want, there's, so, there's a lot more to know. There's a lot more to do. So if you have any questions about the recommendations we gave on this talk, I want you to contact your physicians and be an active participant in your health. I would love for you to visit us on our Facebook page at It's Autoimmune. All together, It's Autoimmune. I'd like to thank you for listening to us on It's Not You, It's Autoimmune, which is presented by the eCenter Wellness, a nationally recognized wellness clinic where patients enjoy a better quality of life as partners in their own health. And find them online at, at uh, eCenterWellness.com. And for more information about this episode and past shows, there's a lot, uh, visit us on www.autoimmunepodcast.com and the eCenterWellness.com. You can visit our socials, like, follow, and share, please, on Facebook at It's Autoimmune, on Instagram at It's Not You underscore It's Autoimmune. This is Dr. Jocelyn Eberstein signing off from UBN Go Studios in Burbank. Until next time, stay well and do good in this world. <laughs>